So good morning. We're uh, we're going to continue in the the wake of our AutoCAD uh, frenzy, and we're going to take our AutoCAD file and do some work on it, post processing, so to speak, in Illustrator. And I think this is a good place to kind of see how the two can be interconnected. Um, we won't spend an inordinate amount of time doing this because we do have to move on to SketchUp rather soon, uh, such that we can get out the, the final <laughs> project of the semester. So we don't have a whole lot of time left, but at the same time, I want you to see what some simple post processing can really do to enhance your AutoCAD drawings and make them more readable on the wall, et cetera. So uh, this is definitely about taking what we've done in AutoCAD and doing some enhancements to it, um, and also kind of reinforcing some of the stuff that we've done uh, in the world of um, uh, in the world of Illustrator as well, so I went ahead and I opened back up my uh, work from last class, exercise 122, which I know that the the handouts are wrong, so you have a slight discrepancy. It said 123 last class, I was off by a number, um, so we have a duplicate of 123, or or last time it was really 122, and that was my mistake. Uh, so what I did is I took my work from exercise 122. And I'm going to go ahead and print it, just like you did. And I'm going to make sure that it's DWG to PDF, which it should be for you. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And I will save this uh, to my flash drive as, um, if I can find my flash drive, as today's exercise. So exercise 123. Let me create a new folder. One twenty-three, and we'll go ahead and save this as one twenty-three, and I'll click save. And then this is—it uh, will open up a preview uh, in Acrobat that shows the drawings that I had. So again, I got rid of the the borders uh, around each of the viewports, and I have uh, all four of my elevations uh, with my floor plan here. Now, one of the great things about DWG to PDF as the printer, and I'm going to go ahead and close. Um, that for just a second is that if I go into Adobe Illustrator and then I open that PDF file that I just created, the PDF file actually contains all the lines that are live. So we don't get just the JPEG image, we actually get lines that we can work with, uh, which is a big deal. So if I go to File and then Open and I open up that PDF that I just saved. Uh, PDF is a file that Illustrator recognizes much in the way that um, uh, it would recognize in AutoCAD DWG, for example. If I press Control-0, I'll see my whole drawing. Uh, it's there, but it's on its side. Uh, remember, we corrected the side thing when we go to print. Well, in the world of Illustrator, it's not corrected for us, so we have to do a little bit of work. And in order to correct this, we're going to mess with something called the artboard. And I wish that Illustrator looked at this more as hey, this is a page that I have. Let's just switch to landscape orientation. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't. Illustrator uses something called an artboard. And if we look down here, about halfway, 3 quarters of the way down, there's something called the artboard tool. Uh, it looks like kind of like the crop tool in Photoshop. And when I click on that, I get the artboard one, and I get a dotted line around my drawing. At, once I've clicked that, at the ribbon at the top, I can switch to landscape orientation. So I'll click on the Landscape button, and it's now in Landscape Orientation. Unfortunately, it doesn't automatically rotate all of my content. So once this is done, um, we'll go back to the black arrow. I'll select everything, so Control-A. And then I'll use the free Transform tool, the little arrow with the dots. Move to one corner. I'll hold down Shift. And I'll rotate my content so that it fits on my page again. So a little bit. Um, challenging, but at the same time, we can do it. So as I said, when we write this AutoCAD file, let me zoom in a little bit so we can see it, it creates live lines. So I can actually, if I use the direct select or the white arrow, I can come in here and select any one of the lines that I want. So rather than having it just be a flat JPEG, this is something that I can really work with in the world of Illustrator. Okay. So if we look at the layers palette here for a second, and I expand the layers, you can see that I have several what are called clip groups. Well, each of these clip groups is essentially one of my drawings, right? the elevation or the plan, et cetera. Within one of those clip groups, I have, let's make this a little bit wider so that you can see it. right? 
I have a clipping path, and then I have a bunch of other paths that represent all of the lines in my drawing. So you can see part of the reason that Illustrator nests is because there are so many individual little paths uh, in their layers. So now that I have these clip groups, I can actually start to work with and enhance any one of these drawings. Okay? So maybe, for example, I decide that I really think that the line weight at the bottom here isn't right. Okay? It needs to be a little bit thicker. I could use the direct select, the white arrow. I could select this line. I could come over to my line weights, or excuse me, my stroke, and I could change the stroke weight. So it's at 1.68 points. Maybe I want to go up to three point, make it a little bit darker. Right? I can do that for these other ones as well. I could even hold down shift and select multiples at the same time, like that. And I could adjust that line weight so that they were all at three point, or they were all at seven point, depending on how dark I wanted it to look. If I press control zero, you can kind of see how that changes. So the point is that if I was unhappy with a line weight in the world of AutoCAD, I can always make that correction here. Okay? The other thing that I can do is I can use um, these regions and the live paint tool to actually collage in certain pieces. And so some of you may have already filled in your walls, uh, which, is, which is fine to do it in AutoCAD as a hatch. But maybe you want to do it after the fact in the world of Illustrator. So remember, before we do any live paints, I always want to make sure that I duplicate the layer that I'm working on. So first thing I'm going to do is I'll, I'll select layer one. I'll click the little flyout menu, the triangle with the, the four lines. And I'll say duplicate layer one. And that lets me have just a copy that I can work on. And I, I always like to do it on a copy and then turn off the main layer so that I can come back and get where I started. Right? So there's never, there's never uh, something that I can't undo or go backwards on. So now that I have the copy, I want to start with the plan. So if I were to select the, the plan here, let me use the black arrow like this. And I'll come over and I'll use the live paint tool, which is under the shape builder tool. And we'll come over and, ah, OK. So sometimes this does happen. Because this is currently in a clip group, I'm not going to be able to work on it. So I have to release that clipping group. So if I look here, I believe this is my plan. Nope, let me find out. There's my plan. I'm going to take this clip group, and I'll go to the little flyout menu. And I'll come down here and say, release to layers, release clipping mask, sorry. Okay. It just becomes a group now. Now I can actually work with it. So we'll go ahead and select it. And now we can see that I select all the individual lines. And then I can come back with my live paint bucket tool, and I can make this a live paint group. Okay. Once I've made it a live paint group, you guys have done this before, I can start to fill in uh, various regions of my drawing. So let's, let's start with just a color. Right? And obviously, I'm going to change the color because I don't want my ground to be pink. But I want to start with a color that's easy to see. So we'll go ahead and I'll paint in this section. Oops. There. Ah. You've got to love it when stuff doesn't work the way you want it to. For some reason, I'm stuck in RGB color mode or in, in grayscale color mode. So I'm going to come over to the color palette here, click on the fly out, and switch to RGB. If you get in the same boat, I can help you through that. I don't know why it's doing that for me. But there we go. Now we've got that. Let me go ahead and paint this. And I think I have everything that I want. But I'm also going to change the color and paint the walls in a different color. So if you, had, if you struggled with the hatch tool and it didn't work for you, this is an opportunity to essentially do the same thing after the fact. Let me zoom in a little bit. And I'm just using spacebar to pan. So I hold down spacebar so that I can pan. Got a few more pieces to fill in here. Like that. One more right there. All right. So when I'm done with the live paint, I'm going to go ahead and click this expand button, okay? which is going to 
basically break apart the live paint and allow me to select any one of these color regions as its own entity. Okay? Now, unfortunately, I think the red and the blue is probably not the most attractive uh, solution. So I'd like to fix that. Uh, and I could do that by picking a nice color of gray or whatever seemed appropriate using, right? again, I could select the floor, for example. I could come here, and I could pick a color of maybe kind of a brown color, maybe something like that. And I could have my floors being brown. It's still rather unattractive. So I'm going to take it a step further, and I'm going to go to the website, and I'm going to download this Prismacolor Architectural Markers set uh, to use as a little bit of collage work behind. I got it from resources and then swatches. And it's under the feature swatcher, swatches. It's the first set. And I will load this swatch set. So if you guys remember loading the swatches, I go to the swatches um, little window here. I click the little triangle flyout. And I say, open swatch library, other library. And I'm going to go browse for that set of swatches. I have already downloaded it and put it on my flash drive it's right here. And it will then open up. So this is designed to mimic the set of actual architectural colors that Prismacolor has uh, in terms of the colors that are offered. So what I can do is I can select one of these regions, and then I could fill it with kind of a light gray. And the advantage of something like this, let me do something a little bit darker. Maybe you can see it better. I'll do it dark to begin with. This is not the color I'm ultimately going to pick, but I'm trying to let you see it, is this has a little bit of streaking and modeling to it. So it looks like if you kind of hand colored it in, which can be really nice on a plan. Though I would probably stick with one of the more subtle colors uh, rather than something too strong. Let me take this, and we'll, we'll put that ash gray color on it. And I'd like to do all of the walls. Now, selecting the wall and then holding down Shift and going through and selecting all the walls is a little bit tedious. So I'm going to use a, uh, I se I've selected one of the walls, but then I'm going to use a shortcut. And I'm going to go to the Select menu, and then I'm, I'll go to Same Fill Color, which is going to select all of the blue. And then I could add, say, a little bit darker color to the walls. That's not dark enough. Maybe something like this, right? such that the walls stand out a little bit in contrast to the floors. Okay? And again, the floors are probably a little light for you to see. I can see it on my screen uh, just fine. So now I've done the live paint on this particular piece. And maybe it's time to do the same kind of a live paint on one of the elevations. So let's come over to this elevation. And remember that this is still within its own clipping mask, so I'm not going to be able to do the live paint. So let's come over to my layers again. And again, I'm still working on my copy only. Okay? We'll figure out which one is this top elevation. There it is, it's this clip group. I'll select it, go to the flyout menu, and say release clipping mask. Now it's just a group, and now I can use it as my live paint group. So we'll select it. There it is. And then I'll go over to Live Paint. When I click on it, I can say I want to make a Live Paint group. Now I'm going to do two things with two different colors. And you'll see that my strategy is always pick a color first uh, for, the, for the various things that I want to fill in, and then correct it to whatever the swatch is or whatever the, the, the clipping mask is after the fact. So let's do one that is kind of a gray color for the concrete. And so I'll pick the concrete pieces. Like that. OK. Let's pick one color. And I'll do like a blue for the windows or the glass. And I'll do one more color. Maybe I'll pick a bright color for the, the frames of the windows. So let me zoom in here. This one will be a little bit more tedious. So I have all of those selected now. 
Let me press Control-0 so we can zoom out. And then let me zoom in a little bit so we see this elevation. When I'm done with the live paint, again, I'll do Expand. And the Expand then breaks it into the component pieces. So let's start with the, uh, the gray. And I want to put like a Prismacolor on that. So I'll select one of the grays and then go to Select, Same, Fill Color. All of the grays selected. And then I could apply one of the, the Prismacolor markers to it. Maybe it's the same as the, the floor, for example. So you guys could see it. I could do it a little bit darker. But you get the idea that I'm just picking one of the Prismacolor uh, marker colors. Now, let's say I wanted the glass to be a different color. Okay, So I can select one of them. And I could say, select same fill color. And I could change the glass to be maybe a nice pale blue or something like that. And now all the glass would be that pale blue. It still looks a little bit like SketchUp's generic glass to me. It's not, it's not that accurate. So I'm actually going to take this one step further. And that is I'm going to collage an image behind this rather than just leave it to these little blue squares. And this gets a little bit trickier. Uh, I used to, it's, it's very interesting how trends change over time. When I was in grad school, this was the technique. This is how we did collage work. It was always an illustrator, and it was always using what I'm about to do, which is a complex clipping mask. That's what we always did. So when I first started teaching this class nine years ago, this is what I started teaching. And everybody learned how to do this. The truth is that things have changed, and we're now far more comfortable in Photoshop, and we can do better collage work in Photoshop. So we've switched out of doing this method and doing more of a Photoshop method. So I will spend the bulk of the time um, when we're doing SketchUp not doing Illustrator collages, but instead doing Photoshop collages. Uh, and so you'll see the difference. So I know that this is a rather challenging piece of Illustrator technique, but at the same time, I at least want to expose you to it. There is a tutorial that I wrote up about how this happens. If you go to Tutorials and then Illustrator, it'll be Clipping Mask from Live Paint. And there's actually a video that walks you through exactly what I'm doing and a bunch of steps that'll, that'll tell you how to, how to do this. Okay? So it is there if you get a little bit lost. Um, but I've already done the Live Paint on this. I've already selected all of the objects. And what I'm going to do, now that those are all selected, is I'm going to create its own layer. So let me create a new layer. And I'm going to call this layer Live Paint. And let's do Windows. Live Paint dash Windows. Okay? And I'm going to move all of these blue objects onto that Live Paint Windows layer. And those objects, since they're selected, are represented by this little square in the Layers palette. And I'll go ahead and drag that square up to my Live Paint Windows layer. And then I can actually turn off everything except the windows. So now all I'm seeing are those windows. Okay. So now that I have a layer with all the windows on it, there they are, all is paths. I need all of these paths to become one path instead of a bunch of individuals. So I'm going to select all of them like that. And then I'll go up to Object, Compound Path, Make. And we did this, if you remember back in the world of Illustrator or in InDesign when we had our various frames and you wanted an image to span across all the frames, we selected them, we went to Object, Compound Path, Make. Same strategy here. So Object, Compound Path, Make. There we are. And now I'll go ahead and find an image. We'll go online here. Let's do search.creativecommons.org. Let's look for sky. There we go. I'll pick some kind of a sky that looks attractive. We'll do this one. Okay, nice clouds. Works for me. Let's go ahead and download the original size. And let me copy it to today's exercise here. Paste it. There it is. And let's go back here. Now I'm going to go to File and then Place, just like an Illustrator. And I'm going to drop this sky into the scene. So it's a lot bigger than I originally needed it. So I'll use the Free Transform tool and I'll scale this down. And what I'm ultimately looking for is for this to be about the size of my windows. 
something like that. Okay? I also want to make sure that my linked file, this object, is below the compound paths. And I can do that by right clicking on the object and saying arrange send to back. Or I could just drag the linked file below the compound path. So in order for this technique to work, we have to have this on its own layer. We have to have the compound path that represents all of my windows. And we have to have the linked file below the compound path. So it has to be in this exact order. When I'm done, I'll select the Live Paint Windows layer. I'll come up to my flyout, and I'll say Make Clipping Mask. And when I do that, these objects will now clip the sky to represent my windows. So I no longer have just kind of a generic blue. I have a bunch of uh, squares that have the sky kind of pasted through them. Okay? To me, this is still a little bit strong. And so I may select my link file, go to the opacity settings, and drop the opacity down, maybe 70%, something like that. It's just not quite as photographic. So I now have those pieces done. If I turn back on my copy here, right, you can kind of see how it fits in. I haven't dealt with the, um, the windows just yet. So we have to do those as well. So let me select. Actually, I'm going to turn off the windows here. I need to select one of the window frames. So we'll select that. And then I'll select same fill color. And we'll make this kind of a brown or a wood color. And for the interest of repetition, I'm going to do it the same way with the clipping mask, just so that you guys see me do it twice. Right? In reality, we could probably get away with just doing uh, kind of a brown color, because there's not too much texture that's going to show up through these thin little lines. But at least you can see it. So I have those selected. I'm going to create a new layer. And we'll call this Live Paint dash uh, window um, frames. Okay, I'm going to move my objects onto that Live Paint window frames layer. There it is. We'll turn off everything but the Live Paint window frames. I have to make sure that those are one compound path. Now this one's a little bit challenging because it has a mixed group of compound paths and paths. But if I select everything and I go up to Object, Compound Path, Make, it will still convert all of those compound paths and um, regular paths into one compound path. So it will still nest it all together. OK, so I have the one compound path. Now I need an image of wood. So let's go back here. And we'll search for wood texture, something like that. I'm going to do something like this. I just ultimately want this to be a bit of a mottled color. This is probably too close up, but we'll use it anyway. Let me go ahead and download the original size. And let me copy it again to my flash drive. We'll paste it. There it is. And now, in the world of Illustrator, I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll drop this in. Again, it shows up much too large, so we need to shrink it down. Maybe a little bit bigger, right like that. And again, it has to be at the back. So this time, I'll drag the order, which does the same thing as right-clicking and saying Arrange, Send to Back. It's identical. So I have a live paint layer, I have a compound path, and I have a link file exactly in that order on one layer. There it is. I'll select the top of the stack. Click the flyout menu and say make clipping mask. And it will now make a clipping mask with that wood texture representing the, uh, the window frames themselves. Now again, this is probably a little bit strong. So let me select it, change the opacity down a little bit. And so now if I come back and I turn on my live paint windows, I've got my frames, I've got my windows, and I also have my background. Okay? Now, one of the things that's important is when you get to this stage of it, um, I probably should take all of the objects 
that I created here, let's lock these two for a second, all of these objects and put them on their own layer as well. So let me select same fill color. There they all are. And let's create a new layer for the concrete. So we'll say concrete. And we'll put those on the concrete layer. And so this is just a way of helping kind of organize your file. So I have these fills. I have a window, window frames, and concrete. What I'm going to do is instead of turning on my lines that are on layer one, I'm going to turn on my lines, or on the copy, I'm going to turn on the one that's at the top of the stack. The advantage here is that all of these lines will be on top of any of the collage texture that I've done. So if I were to adjust anything, they're always going to show up uh, on top. Okay? So let me press Control minus, and now we can see that I've collaged that. We can also see that I've collaged this piece over here. Okay? So I can do the same thing, and I can collage through uh, more of my elevations or less of my elevations. One of the important things to, to recognize when you're doing this is to only do what feels right. So just because I showed you the technique to collage the windows and the siding and the frames and everything else, if you did something like, say, the frames, and you're like, yeah, I don't really like it or I don't think it looks good, go ahead and turn that off and let it live as part of the, the drawing. Perhaps turn off the concrete altogether right, and have just the windows. It's a matter of what looks right. Maybe the windows are too strong and you want just the concrete to show up. right? it still is a way of identifying your building. So you have to decide what's right in terms of the look, not just do it because I gave you all of these various techniques to, to use. Does that kind of make sense? So use your own mind to edit, and just because I suggest that these are various techniques doesn't mean you have to do it in your assignment 105. Think about what's right, and then, then do it from there. So the other thing that, that ends up happening is sometimes you want to add some text. Okay. And we have spent a whole lecture talking about typography and what the appropriate text would be for various types of buildings. You want to think about that as part of your design here. So what's the right font? Uh, what would identify the east elevation? So for example, right, let's say I came in here. This is actually the north elevation right here. And I wanted to put some text in. Right, let me go ahead and use the type tool. We'll start here. And this is the east elevation. I can use, in this case, I'm, I'm in the default right now. I can adjust the size. Right? And again, I want to look at this as an overall drawing and recognize that it's ultimately going to pre be printed as a 24 by 36. So if it's too large in size, it's going to look kind of funny to have this giant text. And I think one of the biggest problems w that I see consistently with posters that are done in 220 and 221 is that the text is too large. Right? When we're looking at it this way, and you look at this little tiny east elevation, it looks pretty small, right? Wouldn't you agree? So the tendency is, oh, let me take this, and I'll make it so that I can really see it. Right, something like that. OK, that looks better. Okay. The problem is, when I print this, east elevation is going to be like this long and this tall. Right? It's way too big. So we want to think very carefully. It would be as if I'm looking at it more like this where it's big, bold, east elevation. right? So we need some kind of middle ground. So what I like to do is I like to see the elevation. I like to take the font and make an appropriate size adjustment for the elevation. So I know, right, based on my building, about how big this is going to be. Maybe that's going to be about six inches or so. I want my font to be you know, maybe an inch or two in size. Right? So not, not overly big. Something like that is probably reasonable. Right? 18 point seems, seems OK. I'm going to arrange it a little bit so that it feels like it belongs as part of this drawing. And then maybe I'll copy and paste it. Now, I have the ability to do it as east elevation in mixed case. I could instead take this, and we'll drop it right below here. And I could take this and say this is east, east elevation. Some people like to get a little bit more creative, and they might do oops, sorry, something maybe a 
And this is, again, it's up to you what feels appropriate. Some people like to make it more of a graphic element as part of their, their overall piece, you know, where they might do something like that. And that then lives as its own piece of the drawing. Oops, let me take no. All right. Again. The risk is that the east becomes too big. Does that make sense? So I'm spending time really thinking about what this looks like. Maybe you decide that you really want to fill in the ground below. right? So you take this and you say, this needs to get you know, filled in with maybe a color. No, come on. Sorry, I was making sure it worked. You fill it in with a color right, to give it a little bit more ground. And then that shows, the text shows in contrast to whatever that is. Do you kind of see how I'm playing with these? It's really, it's about seeing what looks right for you uh, as you start to create something like this. Okay? And I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. It's just, it's a preference. Okay? The other thing, let me back up for a little bit here. Right? The other thing is font choice. And so I picked a very generic sans serif font. Clean kind of works with my modernist or semi-modernist design or postmodern, depending on how you want to classify it. Um, maybe you want to look at it far more architecturally. And um, if you were trying to do something like that, you want to look for a font that feels, quote, architectural. The city blueprint and the country blueprint fonts are both built into AutoCAD, and they're not really that attractive. Um, there is one that I've found that I really like. Uh, that I use a lot in my own uh, work. It's available online if you do a Google search for Frank the Architect. Uh, it's this font. It's based on Francis Ching's work uh, and his hand lettering. It's pretty good and it's free to, uh, free to download. There is a paid version. If you wanted a paid version, you could support the guy who, who actually created it. But it's decent. Um, and so if you wanted to, to download that and, and use it, you can certainly use that as well. Uh, you would have to install the font temporarily on your system, and then use it that way. The other thing that can happen as part of one of these is you may want to have um, title blocks or something like that. Now, in a poster environment, you're, you're generally not going to have title blocks. But in an office, you probably will have title blocks. So I at least want to show you that this is something that you may end up doing. I have a few very casual title blocks that you can download as well. If you go to today's exercise, um, at the bottom, there's a zip file with sample title blocks, a bar scale, and some annotations. You can download that zip file and extract it to your flash drive. The good news about it is they're designed for Illustrator. So you can just go to File and then Place. And I thought I put it. It's under Resources, sorry. Uh, there we go, Title Blocks and Scales, Illustrator. Uh, this is a 24 by 36, so I'll drop the casual title 24 by 36 in. We'll go ahead and crop to media. And there it is. I can line it up with my paper size. Now, it blocked out what I was working on. So if I right click, hello, buddy. Uh, if I right click on it and I say arrange, send to back, right? it'll go behind everything else. And you can see down here at the bottom, right, that I can put in drawing title, client name, address, what sheet number it would be, something like that. If I need to get in and edit this, I can double click it. And if I keep double clicking it, I ought to be able to get in and edit it. And if it's not, it's going to let me back out here for a second. Let me right click on it. Uh, I might have to, sorry. Sorry, it's right in front of me. At the ribbon here, if I click on embed, 
and say OK. It's going to let me come in, and then now here we go. I can edit the drawing title and change the name to something else. So I have to actually embed it before I can change these things. Uh, but they're available to you, and you can obviously adapt that to your, to your liking. Okay. Uh, once again, if I back out, I have the title block. Maybe I want to drop in a graphic bar scale, which is always a good idea. I'll go to File and then Place, and I could use these are quarter inch. So I could bring in the drawing scale at quarter inch. I could say OK. And I could place that in relation to my various drawings. So this represents the drawing scale. Right? It's just something that you can drop in if you want. OK, so that's there. Uh, I also gave you a note. So if I go to File and then Place, you could create this on your own. But sometimes it's nice to have something that somebody else set up for you. Uh, it's just a note. And we could embed this, change this to say something, uh, window. Let's get rid of that part. Adjust this down a little bit. Oops. And then we could use our direct select. And I could say, that is a window. Oh, it very conveniently went behind my object. Let me right click and say, arrange, bring to front. So it's in front. Now it's supposed to be in front of my objects. I may have to put this on a layer. Yeah, this is my mistake. I need it to go on a layer on top of everything else. So let me take that plus this. Put it up on top of everything else. And it's still doing a terrible job of doing what I want it to do. Now, I'll have to sort out why that's not, not showing up, but we'll, we'll figure it out. The point is that it's a little note that you could put on. You could create it yourself if you wanted to. Okay. So this is very much about making the final presentation of your pieces. And so it's not required that you put a title block in. It's not required that you put a note in. I think it's probably a good idea to put whatever the text would be relating to your particular views. So um, I think I said this was the north elevation, and I wrote east. So go figure. Right? <laughs> Let's change that to north. Right? Um, so go ahead and do your collaging. Um, make it look decent, which is certainly the idea. And then press Control-0. When you're all done, we're going to save this. So I'll go to File and then Save. And then you're going to be required to do a couple different things as part of your assignment. For today, you just need to post the final PDF. Okay? If you want to have a JPEG of it to use as the featured image, you can in Illustrator just go File, Save for Web, and it'll create a little JPEG for you. So that's easy. Okay, But ultimately, for your Assignment 105, you're going to need to plot it. Right? Give me the plot. And then you can have the plot back. Um, and you're going to post this PDF as part of your Assignment 105. Separate post from today. Okay? Assignment 105 is due next Monday. So you have between now and then to, to finish it. You should basically have been working on this all along. So my guess is you're pretty, much, pretty close to done other than this last little collaging. Um, I'm going to save this. And then I will show you how to plot this on one of the back plotters okay? so that you have experience doing that in this room. The problem is that the cables for those plotters won't reach to this computer, so I can't record it and show you, and so you guys can watch it later. And I also can't show you up on the screen how to do it. So we're going to have to do it um, down at one of those computers, and you guys will have to crowd around a little bit. Okay? So I'll get this saved, and then we'll move down there, and I'll show you that uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Are there any questions? No? All right.